Right at the start of part three of Spinoza's Ethics is a preface, and it's an extraordinary piece of writing. It's not very long, but it outlines his approach to the topic of the emotions, because part three of the Ethics deals with the emotions. His approach to the whole thing is that our emotions are a natural phenomena. They're exactly the same as a storm or the way a billiard ball bounces around a billiard table. Our emotions are the product of what he would term natural laws. And so to understand the emotions, we can study them in a fairly scientific and objective manner. In fact, he uses the, the term a geometrical approach, which is a little bit um, obtuse, I have to admit, but all the same. He was trying to put emotions on the basis of a science or the study of the emotions. So this is a preface to part three. I'm going to read through it with comments as and where they seem to be appropriate. So, he says, most of those who have written about the emotions and human conduct seem to be dealing not with natural phenomena that follow the common laws of nature, but with phenomena outside nature. Now, it is the case that most people see their emotions as something special, something that is unique to human beings, and in fact the emotions are basically just our raw reaction to our environment and to how well we are surviving. So, on that basis, it might be possible to study the emotions in an objective kind of way, to look at how we are affected by one set of circumstances or another set of circumstances. Anyway, uh, the study of the emotions is just as um, objective or as, as um, ideal for an objective treatment as the study of anything else in Spinoza's world. And he says most people study the emotions as though they're outside of nature, as, all, as though we are some special kind of case. Anyway, he goes on, they appear to go so far as to conceive man in nature as a kingdom within a kingdom. And this is the human vanity, isn't it? That we believe that we are somehow outside of general nature. And hence, our response to the environment is not something that just flows the way it flows, as everything else does. But our emotions are very special, meaningful, um, and deserve some special kind of treatment. They believe that he, humanity, mankind, man, disturbs rather than follows nature's order and has absolute power ho over his actions. And aren't people like that? And if you read a lot of Spinoza, then you will see that he has no truck with the idea of free will. And that we are subject to influences, causes, and that we actually only see the effects. So if you're thirsty, you will just say, well, I desire a glass of water. But the fact is your body needs fluids Maybe you haven't drunk water for several hours or whatever. And so there's a chain of causes that lead up to you saying, I desire water or you know, I want a cookie or whatever. Um, we are just as much subject to cause and effect as anything else. So, he goes on to say, again, they assign the cause of human weakness and frailty not to the power of nature in general, but to some defect in human nature, which they therefore bemoan, ridicule, despise, or as is most frequently the case, abuse. Now here he's saying that the way we react to events is a very natural thing. There's nothing wrong with, as you will see a little bit later, there's nothing wrong with envy or hatred or anger or whatever. These are our genuine responses to the environment. And when he says that uh, people bemoan, ridicule, despise, or abuse, he's really talking about the religions. The religions look at the way men behave, and they set themselves on high, and then judge what is happening 
um, or judge the, the way that people manifest and say you shouldn't do this and you should do that and yeah, if someone is um, for the sake of argument uh, greedy then we look at it and we ridicule it we don't see that actually the greed has a cause and if that person could understand the cause they might have more of an interest in doing something about it that sounds like I'm being judgmental it isn't um, if someone is greedy then there is just a set of circumstances that is driving them to behave in that kind of way and no ridicule or bemoaning or whatever is applicable that's just the way it is he who can criticize the weakness of the human mind more eloquently or more shrilly is regarded as almost divinely inspired <laughs> Spinoza is very critical of religion and he's having a direct dig here at um, the way people are priests um, so-called gurus and so on and so forth uh, for Spinoza well, the way we manifest is just the way we manifest nothing wrong with it it might not be useful for us so it might not be useful to be greedy but that's a wholly different thing to it being wrong yet there have not been lacking outstanding figures who have written much that is excellent regarding the right conduct of life and have given to mankind very sage counsel and we confess we owe much to their toil and industry however as far as I know no one has defined the nature and strength of the emotions and the power of the mind in controlling them I know indeed that the renowned Descartes though he too believed that the mind has absolute power over its actions does explain human emotions through their first causes and has also zealously striven to show how the mind can have absolute control over the emotions but in my opinion he has shown nothing else but the brilliance of his own genius as I shall demonstrate in due course for I want now to return to those who prefer to abuse or deride the emotions and actions of men rather than to understand them <laughs> that word understanding I don't know what's happened in modern society maybe we've just been too influenced by the uh, religions and philosophies of the East but understanding is where the power is a very simple example I've quoted many times is that you know, 10 20,000 years ago or however long ago people would be quivering in their mud huts or wherever they lived at that time when there was a thunderstorm possibly believing it was the anger of the gods as soon as we understood that thunder was created by an electrical discharge the whole thing became rather less threatening and unless you do something stupid like climb to the top of a tree and wave your arms about then you're probably not in any danger so <clears throat> understanding has that power to effectively dissolve away a whole pile of emotions and that's what part three of the ethics and part four are all about so um, where have I got to um, they will doubtless find it surprising that I should attempt to treat the faults and follies of mankind in the geometric geometric manner and when Spinoza is talking about faults and follies he's not talking about judgment here he's just saying there are ways to live that are more pleasant than other ways and it is a folly for example to be frightened of thunder it's, it is a folly to look at anger and to say it is wrong yeah um, I would say I could talk about that for a long time because uh, part three is full of all that kind of stuff um, and that I should propose to bring logical reasoning to bear on what they proclaim is opposed to reason and is vain absurd and horrifying but my argument is this in nature nothing happens which can be attributed to its defectiveness for nature is always the same and its force and power of acting is everywhere one and the same that is the laws and rules of nature according to which all things happen and change from one form to another are everywhere and always the same so our approach to the understanding of the nature of things of every kind should likewise be one and the same namely through the universal laws and rules of nature therefore the emotions of hatred anger envy etc etc considered in themselves 
follow from the same necessity and force of nature as all other particular things. So there we are, Spinoza is saying that anger, envy, hatred are not faults of the human um, construction. They are natural responses to the environment. Again, they might not be useful, but that's a wholly different matter. And he's just saying the, the, um, the forces of nature are at work on us as much as anything else. And above everything else, we strive to survive. And because we strive to survive, anything that threatens that will make us possibly angry or fearful or whatever. And anything that reinforces us, we will like. It will be pleasurable. Uh, we may love something that reinforces us. In fact, for Spinoza, love is synonymous with pleasure. That's a whole other topic. So these emotions are assignable to definite causes through which they can be understood, that word again, and have definite properties equally deserving of our investigation as the properties of any other thing whose mere contemplation affords us pleasure. It's a very, very big concept. The notion that the emotions we experience, even if it is hatred, through understanding what is happening, that understanding can bring us pleasure, much like understanding how to play the piano or mathematics or whatever your thing happens to be. I shall then treat of the nature and strength of the emotions and the mind's power over them by the same method as I have used in treating of God and the mind. And I shall consider human actions and appetites just as if they were an investigation into lines, planes or bodies. In other words, an objective analysis of what's going on within us when we experience various emotions. And he mentions God there, and I've mentioned it many times in various podcasts, that for Spinoza, God is synonymous with existence. There's a bit more to it than that, but... Um, so when Spinoza uses the word God, he's not talking about some anthropomorphic entity. He's talking about the power of existence, something wholly different. So there we have it. Uh, he's laid out very clearly that part three of his ethics will analyze and look at emotions from an objective standpoint and give us the understanding we need to be able to have some control over them if we want to have some kind of control over them. And in fact, the, the whole idea of control is perverted. Control does not come from you know, what some people might consider to be discipline or will. Control comes through understanding. There is a power associated with understanding. As I mentioned in the uh, thunderstorm example, once you understand something, the power of it dissolves away to a large extent. Anyway, uh, in my opinion, what Spinoza is laying out here isn't just theory. There's a whole practice involved in all of this. And if you um, are interested in practice, then go to the Philosophy Workshop website because uh, there's stuff there that might, might interest you. And also, the text for this uh, preface is also on the website. I'll put a link below.